Hello, it's JJ DiGeronimo from TogetherWeSeek.online, and today I am with Heidi Bright. Heidi comes to me through a really interesting way. I actually found Heidi through a series of connections and searches as I was looking for a really instrumental editor for a series of pages that I thought might possibly be um, my third book, but I was quite unsure how that was going to come together. And when I met Heidi, I had such a good feeling, not only because of her title of her first book, but the work that she has done to date. And I turned to uh, my pendulum to ask if I should be working with Heidi, because I just still wasn't completely sure. I feel like my ego was getting the best of me. And when I sat down with my pendulum, not once, but twice, and I got it all set up and was asking yes, no questions, just to be sure that it was aligned with my energy. And then I asked my pendulum about Heidi, my pendulum was such a big yes that it was going outside the dimension of my hand. And so I knew that I should work with Heidi. And I know after a couple of weeks of working with her, she too said that she sat down and did a meditation. And she said during her meditation, what came to her was an outline, which is exactly what I needed to get out of my page after page after page of content of how I was going to fold this all into a bigger story. So I am so honored to be here with Heidi in this way with you right now because she's so instrumental in my journey. But what we're going to talk about today is her spiritual seeking and her travels that have really brought her to all ends of the earth, really finding her truth and her seeking, which is really the basis for her next book. So Heidi, thank you for joining us. And I can't even wait to jump into spiritual travel. But before we do, I just wanted you to share a little bit about who you are for somebody who's never met you. Well, who I am. <laughs> um, I have been on a spiritual path my whole life. And I ended up writing three traditionally published books, but I also had highly aggressive and stage cancer, and that completely changed my life. I've been in uh, remission with no evidence of disease and no treatment of any kind for 11 years, so I'm very happy to be alive. That's a lot of who I am. That is fantastic, and I know that is, you know, when people go through such a traumatic situation, I know you have different things that have happening, it kind of sometimes acts as a catalyst. So, Tell us a little bit first about spiritual travel and what it is, then we can dive into some of the things of how you got started down that path. Okay. Um, spiritual travel to me is going to a specific place where there is a lot of spiritual history and a lot of spirit, supposedly some spiritual energy, although I don't necessarily feel it. Some people do. But it's a place that can activate things in the body that I might not even be aware of, but I experience things like. I have uh, an increased ability to concentrate when I meditate, and I've had like an itchy scalp in places. I go there like I can't stop scratching my head. So things happen in these places that don't happen in ordinary places, and so I like to go visit them. So you get some kind of sensation sometimes, you're saying? Yes. Some people are very sensitive to it, but that's not how my body has operated in the past. Mm, that's so interesting. I wonder if some of these places you have some kind of soul memory. I definitely did at a couple of places. One was the Acropolis in Greece and one was the Sphinx in Egypt. Really? Oh my gosh, that's yeah, so it, exciting. I, I couldn't even breathe when I went there. I just started, I just don't know what hit me, but it went on for about five or 10 minutes. So, yeah, I've had something like that happen. I just can't explain it. I don't have words for what it means. But, it, you know, that's never happened anywhere else, just those two places. And that's pretty spectacular to be open to that, to allow whatever energy is there move through you and then come out in unique ways, really. Thank you. It's been great experiences. Mm, that's fantastic. So what started spiritual travel for you? Because I feel like, oh, that's exciting, but I don't know if I would jump right on it. So what for you got you from thinking about it to doing something about it? Well, it actually goes back to high school, which is 40 years ago. <laughs> I uh, was interested in working in the church and I got a packet of information from a Southern Baptist church saying that I could be a secretary. Like, no. <laughs> 
So I went to college and I developed all these questions about spirituality that nobody could answer. So I ended up going to seminary and working toward a master's degree. It was 96 graduate hours. It took me five years. Uh, the One of the professors there gave a sermon during chapel one time, and I was amazed. She was better than most of the men I'd ever heard. And I thought, doesn't the Bible say that she shouldn't be doing that in a church? This doesn't make any sense. And then one of the, my last semester, I had an ethics class, and the professor spent one 90-minute period talking about women in the Bible. And the information was fascinating. And I went to a seminary library and started researching, and it just mushroomed, and it became my first book, Hidden Voices, Biblical Women and Our Christian Heritage. That is fantastic. And a book I, I started to look at and one that I can totally appreciate because I feel like something's a little lopsided with the churches and there's got to be more to the story. So when we met yep. and you told me that that was one of your book titles, that was one of the indicators for me, like, this is my woman. Because somebody who takes yeah. the time to do that research is here for a bigger purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Well, one of the books that I that I read, I read over a hundred books to um, put the information together for this book. And one of the books was Humanity and God. And it talked about uh, the legend of Martha of Bethany, who was a resentful wife, or I don't know if she was a wife, but anyway, she was a resentful woman. And she ends up in the legend going to Southern France and subduing a dragon. Now, this is a medieval legend, but I was fascinated. How could she go from being resentful to saving lives and subduing evil? Something happened. Well, I had to set all that aside because I had kids to raise, and then I ended up with highly aggressive end-stage uterine sarcoma in 2009. So, of course, that brought everything else to a halt. But while I was dealing with the cancer, I went to see a clinical psychologist, and she said, you are dripping with resentment. Sounds like Martha of Bethany. So I knew I had to do everything I could to survive. And I thought about Martha and what she did, and I realized what she did is she changed her attitudes, then she changed her behavior, and then she made some major life choices. And so I pretty much followed that pattern, working with my clinical psychologist, and two years after the diagnosis, I ended up completely free of any evidence of cancer. And I had been free of any treatment ever since. So. I wanted to know more about Martha and her journey, so I did more reading, and I think everything that I learned about cancer and how to survive and put it together in a book. So it's got over 250 things people can try to survive cancer, because I figured if I could do it, so can other people. And I also do cancer survival coaching to help other people survive cancer. Uh, but along the way, I was still fascinated by Martha. And in 2018, I had the opportunity to go to Southern France. And I looked up the little town where Martha had supposedly lived. And it's called Tarascon, after the monster that she supposedly subdued. And there was nothing in any of the tour books about this little town. And it turns out this was the third most important pilgrimage site in the Middle Ages. And nobody knows about it now. So I had to go. So I went and I spent a full day in the cathedral there. Or I guess, I guess it's a church. It's not a cathedral. But I spent a full day in the church there. And I just had a wonderful experience. And I did a lot of other traveling around southern France to um, a lot of important spiritual sites. And then the next year, I had the opportunity to go to Greece with the same tour guide and did that. And then I realized, you know, there's so many things people just don't hear about uh, when it comes to spirituality and place. And so I began collecting information. And then last year, I went to Egypt. And that was fascinating. It's full of spiritual places. And so I decided that I'm going to write a book about spiritual travel so that people can know 
where to go to experience powerful energy and have great meditation experiences and things like that. And this year I went to four countries around the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Just amazing. Well, you know what? I want to go with you to one of these places. I feel like you could have a travel group that you visit one place, they read the chapter, then you go to the place, then you talk about it, you know, and everyone can split up after that. But I think people are dying for real experiences and, sp and experiences that mean something. Yes, I think so too. Well, I think it's fascinating. I love your books. I love you write books like I do in the sense of like when I'm interested, when I get a bunch of information, I feel like I need to share it. So I love your hidden voices because... For so many of us, especially like my daughter, who's questioning, like, what is this religion thing and where are the women? Yeah, where are the women? <laughs> so that's super interesting. And then you take your cancer experience and you put together a book for people moving through cancer. And I think that these lessons are so, so powerful. Thank you. Well, I saved my life. So I know they're powerful and I know they can help other people. Mm. So let's just that be a moment of just like sharing that energy out and frequency out so more people can find the book because I think like Thriver Soup is such a tool and some people just don't even know where to start. And I think that is so powerful. But then you link it to basically you link it to Martha and then Martha takes you on this journey. And how powerful is that? Yeah. She, but she's only one. She's just two pages in this 250-page book. <laughs> There's so much more in there. It's yeah. It's just packed with them. It's helpful to people. But she was certainly a big part of it for me. And the gratitude of being able to go there and express that to her, whether she actually ever was there or not, I was in a place that was devoted to her, and that's what I wanted. That's a beautiful thing. It's just devoting that energy and grace to her. And I think when you talk about your spiritual travel, even when we talked a little bit um, this week, you talked about so many synchronicities. So do you believe you're on the right path? Absolutely. It was magical. It was magical my time in Italy this year. So you went for about six weeks. You told me you took about 10,000 photos. So do you yep. feel looking back on that, that the trip fed your soul? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It changed me. It changed me in a positive way. I don't know what the what the uh, long-term effects will be, but it definitely helped me grow in a positive way. So I'm very happy about that. And are you afraid? I mean, a lot of people will say, and I've even heard people say this to me even five, 10 years ago, and now even more, like you're traveling by yourself. How do you do that? Are you afraid? Like for anybody who's listening, that is like, I'd like to do that, but what would you do or say to reassure them? Well, I faced down highly aggressive end stage cancer. <laughs> There's not a lot of fear left. I, I'm going to live my life the best way I possibly can every day. And I'm just going to face my fears. Now, one thing that my clinical psychologist taught me is how to face my fear. And that is a big part of my book about surviving cancer. And it is to allow the fear to be what it is and feel it without thinking about it. Once you do that, it the fear is a fight, flight, or freeze response, just like anger and powerlessness and all those things. And we get a chemical dump from the brain into the body. After 90 seconds, the bloodstream washes that out, and we no longer have the sensation of fear, anger, powerlessness, and hurt. But we have to stop the thinking because the thinking is what gets us trapped and keeps us stuck. If I'm facing fear on my trip, then I allow the fear to be what it is without thinking about it. I have to stop the thinking because that's what gets me in trouble. Just feel the sensations of fear in my body. Wait for them to pass through, which is about 90 seconds, without thinking, oh, this is taking a long time or any other thoughts, just feel the sensations in my body. They lift after about 90 seconds, and then I can make a choice. Am I going to live in fear, 
or am I going to ta- have courage and do what I want to do with my life and go forward? That's beautiful. That's, That's beautiful. Good. Yeah. And Byron Katie talks about this too, right? Is like, she has the four questions and determining if you, you know, once, cause most people can't sit there and let it pass through. And most people right away, hold on to it, throw it in their head or throw it in their heart, and then they can't release it. So that's such a great strategy for fear is recognizing it without grabbing it. Without being attached to it, mm. without thinking about it. And it took, it's a practice. It is a practice. And it took me two years to really get what my therapist was talking about. And then about four more years to make it a habit. It's a behavior change. And it just, first you have to change your attitude towards your emotions. Then you have to change your behavior towards your emotions. Once you recognize that the attitude needs to be adjusted, that it's just sensations in the body, then you can change your behavior around it. And then you can make better choices. That's a beautiful recipe. That's a beautiful recipe. So simple. Uh, but I think for so many, we just don't know how, even how to be present enough to do that. So just learning how to just be aware of that fear kicking in. And, mm-hmm. you know, I guess my question to you is now being on the other side of cancer, you know, I've heard a lot of people say cancer is an energy. Cancer is burying something you don't want to do deal with. What do you think cancer is? Well, I think it's many things, um, but largely I think it is something that's not right in, in a person's life and needs to be corrected. Sometimes it's a toxic relationship. Sometimes it's a toxic job. Sometimes it's a toxic attitude that we hold within ourselves. And once we figure out what the root cause is, usually it's not physical. Sometimes it is, like if you're in a toxic environment. Um, like a like a polluting company, but a lot of times it's what we do to ourselves. And once we figure out what it is that we're doing that's not working, then we can make corrections and adjustments. And then the body doesn't need to say, hey, pay attention anymore because we're paying attention. And then it can lift. So much wisdom. And I know just to state for people that you did both traditional and Western medicine for cancer. I just want to be clear that your mindset didn't clear your cancer entirely, but you did both. I would have died without both because I would have, I was on track to die within a matter of a few months when I was diagnosed. And I would have because uh, these, these um, attitude adjustments and changing behaviors, that takes time. It doesn't happen immediately. And so the, Medical treatment bought me time, and I would have died without it. It took me two years to to figure out what I needed to change and change it. So much wisdom, so much wisdom. So Laura on the call mentioned that that her mom got cancer about 10 years ago when she was 76, and her dad read your book, Thriver Soup, in two days. And her mom is now healthy and full of life and in remission. So... I mean, it just speaks so much to your work and thank you so much for sharing that. And I just feel like it speaks so much to the impact of your work. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm happy to hear that your mother is still doing well. Oh, that's so beautiful. So for anybody who's listening, you can reach out to Heidi inside the community. She has a profile with all her information and you can access this replay and share it. But I just think Heidi, for so many of us, you're such a You're such a ray of light that just came into my office, as you can see, that you are a lighthouse for so many, you know, regardless of where they are in their process, like you have insight and wisdom for them along the way. And for those that are uh, adventurous enough, I think this next book, Spiritual Travel, will be such a tool for those that want to get out in the world with meaningful purposeful travel. And I think for many of us, those experiences will not only ground us, but remind us. Yes. And it's a way to give gratitude and appreciation for the good things that we have in life and just to enjoy our lives because there's just so much out there to see and do. 